up? Welcome to a brand new episode of the Fit Women's Weekly Podcast. If you like learning about how to fuel your body properly, what should you be doing during the summertime when the heat starts rising? What should you be focusing on with your nutrition, with your hydration? Then you're listening to the right podcast episode today or watching the best podcast episode for today because that is what we are going to be discussing with RD Rachel Gargano. She is the RD behind RG Nutrition and Wellness, plus she is the head nutritionist at Live It Up Greens, which Live It Up Greens, I will go ahead and put out there, is one of the supplements that I personally love. I do not work with them. They have gifted me product in the past, and I just love them. So when I was able to connect with Rachel, I said, come on, let's talk about greens. Is there actually any science to back up that taking some sort of you know, vegetable supplement, like a green supplement, or you probably have seen red supplements, is there actually any benefit to that? So we're going to talk about that, but we're going to dive deeper into nutrition in general, talking about what women should be doing to fuel their body. What should we be prioritizing? Because at the end of the day, I want to make things simple. And we live in a very overcomplicated time where everything gets overcomplicated and we should be going. And we're focusing on like, should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? But so-and-so says I should be doing this. Things don't have to be so complicated, you guys. So let's go back to the basics of what we should actually be focusing on. And that's what we're going to talk about in this episode. And if you do love Live It Up Greens, again, I do not have any kind of partnership with them. I am not sponsored by them, but they were generous enough to give a discount to podcast listeners, which is FWW10 for 10% off. But let's not get into that yet because first we just need to learn more about green supplements in general to see if that's something that might even work for you. You might not need it, but we'll talk about that in just a second. Before we do, I do want to just make one really, really big announcement. First off, if you are not following the Fit Women's Weekly Podcast, why the heck not? Make sure that whatever it is that you are listening or watching this on, that you're subscribed. And if there's an opportunity to leave a review, it would mean the world to me. It really does help make a difference in growing this podcast so that I can continue to provide this content for you guys. And if you want to help the podcast even more, head over to fitwomensweekly.com and try out Fit Women's Weekly Live. This is my online training studio where every day I go live with brand new workouts. I film the workout from start to finish, giving it my personal all so that I can push you because getting you outside of your comfort zone is where results are made when it comes to your strength and your overall fitness. So you don't have to do the workout live with me, but I do record the entire workout start to finish live so you can do it with me, or you just have to hop onto the app and you hit play when you're ready to knock it out on your own. And it's completely free to sign up and try it out at fitwomensweekly.com. The direct link is down in the show notes. And then one final announcement before we get into this week's podcast. This is a big week of announcements is that we are going to be doing our eight week summer shred challenge starting on June 3rd. So the Monday after Memorial Day, I'm doing an eight week strength and fitness challenge where there are going to be brand new workouts every week. There is a actual tracking sheet so that you know each day what you can be doing outside of your fitness because 30 minutes to an hour of exercise, that's great. But what about the other 23 hours in a day? So I want to make sure that you are doing the least amount of work possible because, again, we don't need to overcomplicate things. But I do want you to know exactly what you should be focusing on to get the results that you need. And if you follow my fitness advice, movement advice, and nutrition advice, yes, I'm going to give nutrition advice during this challenge too, you'll see some amazing results. Now, I am only talking about this challenge with podcast members and on my social media. So if it's something that you're interested in, there's going to be very, very few openings this go around. So just slide into my email, kindle at filmsweekly.com for the early bird registration. And you can go ahead and sign in and lock in your spot and get all the extra information right now. Or you can slide into my DMs Kindle Boyle Fitness over on Instagram, and I'll have all of this down in the show notes too, so you can check it out. But if you want results this summer, you need a little bit of motivation, you're just not feeling your workouts right now, maybe you're going through the steps of your workouts, but you're not actually like doing anything to progress, then this is the challenge 
you deserve. I do the challenge with you. You do it with an amazing group of women, all the Fit Women's Weekly Live members that are in there now. And it's going to take your fitness to the next level. And who doesn't love working out? I don't know. I just personally feel more inspired during the summer. But that inspiration is great. Now you have to actually have the plan. So you have that motivation to get rocking and rolling. I have the plan for you. Let's do this together. All the details down below so that you can get all the information and get yourself signed up on that early bird list for the June 3rd start. Eight weeks. Let's do this together. All right, guys, without further ado, let's jump into our conversation with Rachel. Gosh, don't don't we know that supplements can be a charge topic, right? <laughs> um, so for myself, I actually got interested in nutrition in college. I was a geology major and I oh, got wow. sick. Okay. I know, very, I love rocks. Rocks are great. What a cool, exactly. What a cool thing. I mean, rocks tell so much history. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, exactly. So I thought that was very cool. But then I ate at this random restaurant, a uh, hole in the wall in Vermont. I got really sick and I thought it was just food poisoning, but it didn't go away. And after seeing a lot of different doctors, they found I had this flagellate that is normally found in people, but not very normally a um, disease causing one. And, and so what's a flagellate? It's like a, a single celled amoeba. I had to do a lot of research. Yeah. I was so, a biology major. And I'm like, I don't know if I've ever heard that term before. <laughs> yeah. And so it's called dient amoeba fragilis and I it ate all my nutrition. So I lost a lot of weight. All the doctors I went to kept asking me if I take laxatives and you know, my eating habits. And I was like, I try to eat everything and it all just to be blunt, it all just comes out. Comes out. And yeah. Um, talk a lot of poop as a dietitian. So I don't mind it, but you know, sometimes yeah. it's <laughs> um, as someone so, that is health focused, my husband and I talked way too much, even just today about poop. So it's fine. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So finally I went to a specialist after a year, they finally figured out what was going on mm -hmm. and he put me on the right medicine and it got rid of it. But during that time, it made me really aware of how, what we eat affects us mentally, physically, all of that. And I thought, this is what I want to study. Now, where I went to school, we didn't have anything nutrition, but they had exercise science. And I thought, close enough, going to make it happen. So I switched to exercise science. And um, after that, I thought, okay, I'm going to do more nutrition. I want to learn more. And I, I actually had never heard about a dietitian. So mm -hmm. I went to grad school for nutrition communications. Oh, and wow. while okay. I was there, I heard there's such thing as a dietitian. I thought, oh, maybe that would be kind of cool too. So I did at the same time schooling to get those undergraduate while I was in my my graduate program. And so I took a really circuitous route to become a dietitian. And, um, and that's where I got today. I tried a little bit of clinical, not my bag, mm -hmm. uh, went into um, private practice probably about 14 years ago while kind of as a side hustle. Um, I love, I have my fingers in a lot of different buckets because it keeps me energized and it keeps me happy. I work as a maternal and infant expert in one of my jobs and I work as um, my private practice. I am a sports performance dietitian and, you know, with Live It Up, um, I help to guide um, the nutritional aspects and communication, um, and just making sure we're on the right track in terms of, um, how we talk about it and, you know, helping them understand what is beneficial to be in it and what is not beneficial to be in it. And, you know, how can we kind of navigate, um, the whole process? Uh, mm -hmm. so I love, I love having a lot of different avenues that I can look in and that's kind of where I'm at right now. That's awesome. And I also feel like it's such a cool time to be in the world of nutrition, because even though like my mother-in-law was a registered dietitian, so it's not as if it's necessarily a new science, but I feel like just in, in the past 10 years, we are truly now just learning how important nutrition is for us, not just in weight gain, weight loss, or diabetes, which is what I feel like has been the focus for, I don't know, 30, 40 years, but now we're really learning how important nutrition is for our gut plays a role in our mental health. It plays a yes. role in literally everything that we do. So what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen just in your career of almost 20 years? Do you feel like? Oh man, that is such a great question. Mm -hmm. So 
you know, when we first started, it was very old school. Mm -hmm. We were with how I like to call them the old school dietitians. Like and don't eat eggs because they're going to increase your cholesterol. Don't eat that was my don't have the yolk. Day. Yeah, <laughs> right. exactly. You know, avoid fat. And now we know that you don't want to avoid fat. You just want to switch to the right kinds of fats. And, you know, fats are so important. And yet there was such a big craze in the eighties about everything's low fat. And there is still the, there are still those products out there because there's still that generation who says, yeah, low fat. That's, that's my avenue. I mean, who doesn't remember snack wells? Snack wells, yes. Oh, oh Oleo. Wait, what was right. the name of that fat that tastes Oleola like that? or whatever? Yeah, Oleo or Oleo. it was. Oh, that would. Yeah. I've blocked it. I've blocked it. I don't want to. We won't it. talk about the bad side effects <laughs> that I remember that having. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. So, you know, those are some of the biggest changes. Um, and I think that it's so important to have that turnaround and to come up and say, no, actually, science doesn't show that. And it actually shows that we need to be filling our bodies with the appropriate nutrition. And that doesn't exclude things like fat and getting enough, you know, we need to get enough protein. I think for a while there was, you know, talk about there's too much protein or there's not enough protein. So there's still controversy mm -hmm. when it comes to nutrition. It everyone has an opinion. Everyone's really good about, you know, pushing their opinion. And then there are tiny studies where huge things are extrapolated from them when really they shouldn't be, um, because they're just not telling a lot about societal nutrition. So, um, even though there's still a lot of debate, I feel like we're coming around to more of a centralized view on nutrition. And I think that's just so important for the public because it's, it's a very confusing topic. It's a very, conf and we all have to eat. That's the problem. We all right. have to eat. We yeah. I know it's not something like, you know, if somebody is an overeater, like, you know, if you're an alcoholic, you can just stop drinking alcohol. I mean, it's hard. It's not that easy, but you, yeah. you know, you abstain. Yes. You can't do that. You have yeah. to literally retrain. 40 years of bad habits or however yes. long it's gotten you to that point. That's exactly right. Uh, we, you have to eat and, you know, you can be a live to eater or an eat to liver, but no matter which one you are, you right. can't, like you said, you can't abstain from it. Um, and then, you know, there are definitely some ways that people try to get around that um, by taking the choice out of it, you know, just having smoothies or, you know, shakes and not having to think about like, what should I really be eating? And, but then that, you know, eliminates a whole bunch of the stuff that we need to. So it's, it's important to understand where your habits come from. And it's important to understand what emotional bucket do they fill um, and then how do you work around that and understanding what your body needs mm -hmm. and how can you best fulfill your emotional need for food and your physical need for food in a way that's healthy for your body? Everyone's an individual. We can't all eat the same things. Right. Uh, and so knowing what your body needs is so important. I think that's why it's confusing because some people will say, this is the way to eat. And other people say, this is the way to eat, but really <laughs> The only way is the way you, you eat. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. And I know that most of my listeners are avid into fitness. They're already into their health. They're just learning kind of how to take their fitness to the next level or their health to the next level. Um, biohacking, if you, if you want to look at it that way. So what are some of the things that as an athlete, because even though they're not going to the Olympics, they do train regularly. So what are some of the misconceptions with nutrition that athletes nowadays might fall victim to? And what are the common or the most important things that they should focus on? I talk about protein all the time, but I want to hear it from you how important it is. Basically. <laughs> yes. Well, so, you know, athletes, there are a lot of different levels of, of athletes. And I think that one of the most important things that, you know, any level of athlete kind of falls short on, as you said, is protein, because particularly for women, there is a fear of too much, too much food in general, too much protein, too much muscle mass, you know, too much, but we have to get enough or else we're not going to even get a little of our muscle mass build. Right. And so we do need to get enough calories, which I think a lot of people are under, we need to get enough protein of that. So, um, if we get too much, then many, a lot of that is used for energy, but we have to get enough. And mm -hmm. I think that right now where unfortunately 
the guidelines are a little too low for athletes and they're not really bringing it up as they need to. Um, I think that's kind of one of the biggest things that I hear as far as feedback is, you know, I'm talking to a client, I'm like, you should be getting around X amount grams of protein, but they're like, well, I Google and they say that you should be getting around 0.68 or 0.6 grams. And I'm like, well, that's for like an average American diet. And let's all face it. We don't want to have an average American diet. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. The, the sad diet standard American right. diet. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think the other thing is that once you level up as an athlete, mm-hmm. um, understanding how to fuel your workout and how to recover from it appropriately mm-hmm. is really important. Um, because if one of your goals, for example, is weight loss, uh, I know that a lot of people have a goal for weight loss and they add in exercise to help make that, but people take away too much from around their workout and then their workouts suffer. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're not fueling appropriately before, maybe they're not recovering appropriately after, whether it's having enough protein after strength, whether it is getting a three to one or a four to one ratio of carbs to protein after endurance. You have to be able, I like to call it the parentheses, to have the right foods within the parentheses of your workout, before the workout, during the workout, and after the workout. And those should always be robust. And it's the rest of the time that we want to look at to make sure that we are meeting our other health goals. So are we getting all the right micronutrients from getting enough fruits and vegetables and whole grains? Are we getting enough protein to support? You know, if we're on a weight loss path, you want more protein because you don't want to lose your muscle mass and you want to be more satisfied. So getting appropriate protein is important. And if you're someone who does have more endurance in your day, you do want some whole grains in there. You do need to fuel yourself. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what everyone's day look like, but in terms of how they exercise, but athletes who take away too much from around their exercise won't progress as quickly and won't reach those benchmarks they might be looking for. So really we want to make sure that we're fueling and recovering well. So I'm guessing you are not a fan of fasted fitness in the morning. If you're now, like it a 5 a.m. <laughs> it depends. So okay. I like to call those starvation workouts, Okay, <laughs> but metabolic efficiency is a real thing. And there are studies showing that specifically introduced, um, starvation workouts or workouts where you have fasted overnight, or you haven't eaten for a little while before the workout strategically placed at the right timing of your training can be helpful. Okay. Now, why is it helpful? It's helpful Mm -hmm. because your cells can be trained to use fat as um, a burning source, as an energy Mm -hmm. source more efficiently than um, say only relying on carbohydrates. Now that's not to say that you can eat more fat while you're exercising. A lot of people might say, oh, when I'm out on on a run, I'll eat more fat. And because I am trying to train metabolic efficiency of my cells, I'll be able to to take that in better. That's not what it, it means, right? It means we can use our stored fat more efficiently as an energy source. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that's actually a bad thing, but I do think that if it's done too often, it negates, um, the metabolic efficiency because the primary source of fuel that our body wants to use, no matter what, while we're exercising are carbohydrates and training with carbohydrates on our more intense Uh, workouts is actually more important because then you are building efficiency to have um, more of our metabolic powerhouses, the mitochondria, um, Mm -hmm. be developed within our cells so that we can actually burn more carbohydrates efficiently. So there has to be a balance. So yeah, I'm okay with some fasted workouts, absolutely, Mm -hmm. but it has to be done in the right way and in conjunction with fueled workouts as well. Gotcha. And I know we've talked about in my podcast before the different types of carbs, like simple carbs and complex carbs and the absorption rate and all that fun stuff. Yes. One question that I've actually never asked before is after a strength training workout, when it comes to protein, would it be more beneficial to have something that's already broken down like a whey protein shake versus eating something like a chicken breast? Is there one that might be better for recovery than the other? That's an awesome question. And yes, recovery, because In the 30 to 60 minutes after a workout, our uh, enzymes are working a lot more efficiently Mm -hmm. to to recover and repair. Having something that is broken down more easily, like a powder, does help 
in terms of recovery. After that, it's better to choose the whole foods. But in those in those first 30 to 60 minutes, the studies show that having something like a protein powder after a strength workout can be more beneficial because it raises those amino acids in your bloodstream faster mm -hmm. and it can help with that repair process um, better. Gotcha. And then I wanted to jump over and talk about the live it up here in a second. But my last question is, especially now, that the temperature is rising. One last question about athletic performance is electrolytes. I get a lot of yeah. questions on electrolytes. What's the best kind? What should you look for? And we now know that electrolytes are also beneficial for women for our hormonal health uh, to help keep things balanced as well. What makes a good electrolyte? What should people be looking for when you're cruising the, the aisle? <laughs> This is such a, I love this question uh, because there are so many options now in terms of electrolytes. Right. And it used to just be Gatorade, right? Like back was in it. the day, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. When life was easier and simpler. <laughs> now there are too many choices, like every other category of food, right? Right. So when it comes to hydration and electrolytes, generally speaking, sodium is the primary electrolyte that we lose. Mm -hmm. So that's the one that we want to focus on the most. If you're someone like a, an Ironman who is out there for several hours at a time and doing really strenuous work outside in the heat or humidity, you do have to worry a little bit more about potassium because after about five hours, you start to lose a little bit more potassium. But for the average athlete, sodium is what we're looking for. Now, you don't have to take in just sodium. A lot of them are a balance between sodium, potassium, and magnesium. All three of those are fantastic electrolytes. Uh, I think for the average athlete, what we're looking at is making sure that you're not overdoing it. There are a lot of supplements now that have way too much sodium. Mm -hmm. So you want to look for between 200 and 300 milligrams of sodium mm -hmm. in an electrolyte supplement. If you're out there for an hour or two and it's really hot and you're a heavy sweater and if you're a salty sweater, which means you can see the salt crusting on your gear or on your body after a heavy duty workout, mm -hmm. you want to up that a little bit. Uh, now, electrolytes really don't do much for us unless we're well hydrated. And even just 2% dehydration can lead to feeling more fatigued and poor performance. So going into a workout, you need to be well hydrated. Once you're dehydrated even a little bit, the body doesn't absorb fluids as quickly or as efficiently. And so it's almost impossible to catch back up. So going when it gets warmer, making sure you're well hydrated throughout the day, and then having a little electrolyte either during your workout or a little bit before can help boost that up and okay, help you so stay more hydrated. before your workout versus after. Yes. Yes. Because if you go into it dehydrated, gotcha. you're already going to be on the low side. You mm -hmm. definitely want to rehydrate with electrolytes as well. If you're feeling like you didn't drink enough during your workout, mm -hmm. or you haven't gotten enough electrolytes earlier in the day, rehydration is also important with an electrolyte drink, but beforehand it can make a big impact as well. And what is the right amount when you're saying like you should be hydrated going into your workout? What is the recommended amount of water somebody should be drinking? Because I know this is kind of like an up there. Everybody says something different. It's like, is a gallon what you should be drinking? Is that too much? Should you get three liters a day? What's the real number? <laughs> oh, man. The real number really depends on the... And now they're right. even debating. <laughs> Science is even debating where your hydration should be as an athlete, too. Some people say, no, drink to thirst. That's fine. Mm -hmm. And some people say, no, once you're thirsty, you're dehydrated. Mm -hmm. There isn't a good consensus right now. So I think for women, if we're looking at women, the general consensus is at least six cups um, of eight ounce fluid per day is your minimum. And, and then the rest of your fluid and hydration should come from food. So lots of fruits and vegetables, mm -hmm. um, other watery foods that you eat that boosts up your hydration a lot, a lot of our hydration comes from the meals that we eat. And so starting there as a minimum, the hotter it is, the more you need to up that, or the more active you are, the more you need to up that. For every pound that you lose during exercise, you should be drinking 16 ounces of fluid to recover. So if you're someone who is a heavy sweater and you're not sure if you're hydrating well, take your weight before and after a workout and make sure that you're drinking some of that during your workout and then rehydrating with some of it after. It might not be possible to take in all of that fluid while you're exercising, but when it's hot, I do recommend bringing with you hydration. Otherwise you'll be really low and it's really hard to catch back up. 
Yeah. And I don't necessarily agree either with the idea of like, just drink when you're thirsty, because I also feel like it's kind of like appetite. If you train yourself yeah. to eat less then you crave less, your appetite goes down. Right. Yes. And for me, just my mom's the same way. I don't know if this is like a genetic thing. I am just not a very thirsty individual, but I make sure that I drink a lot of water per day, but I have to force it. To, like I never sit around and just go, man, I could have a sip of water right now. You know, like if that were the case, I'd drink maybe 12 ounces a day. <laughs> I agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. Like I said, I think it's individualized and some people are very aware of those thir thirst mechanisms that happen. Mm -hmm. And some people just aren't. And it's like you said, biology. So right. if you're someone who looks back on the day and says, oh gosh, I only had one or two glasses of water today, then that's a sign that you probably need to be a lot more deliberate about your fluid intake. Mm -hmm. Makes absolute sense. So then how did you, Rachel, get into the Live It Up family? Yeah. So so I am a writer. I Because my master's was in nutrition communications, mm -hmm. I love to write about nutrition. I love to help, you know, bring all that nutrition gar jargon and boiling it down into what the general public can understand and be able to use. And so I started doing some writing for them and they really enjoyed how I was writing about their product. And we started talking about how can we make sure that this product is appropriate? And so they brought me in as their chief dietitian and uh, I have been with them ever since. <laughs> so what exactly, I know I've talked about green powders yeah. before we've, I've tried AG1 and I've tried um, a lot, basically anyone we've tried before. And the way that my husband and I look at it, it's like an insurance policy. We don't take a green and go, oh my gosh, I feel so great. But I do feel like when we go grocery shopping, even though there's abundance of food choices around, when it comes to vegetables, we basically buy the same, like our vegetable section isn't huge, right? Like we get broccoli, Brussels sprouts, um, bell pepper, some sort of lettuce, and that's pretty much it each week. You know, we eat the yes. same vegetables every week. So for us, it's always been like, okay, well... This helps to add variety to our day. My husband hates beets. Well, now through a green supplement, we can still get a little bit of beets, you know? So is that kind of the right outlook? And is there actually science and studies that show any benefit to taking a supplement? Yeah. I love how you look at it. That's exactly how it should be. Greens powders are supplements. Mm -hmm. They're considered dietary supplements. So basically they are blends of dried, powdered vegetables, and plants, herbs, roots, some of them have fruit, some of them include adaptogens, every blend is a little different. Some of them add probiotics, some add digestive enzymes, some include um, even more vitamins and minerals. So they'll add the lab made synthetic vitamins and minerals to boost up their supplement. It's basically a multi multivitamin. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But they're supplements. And it's exactly how you want to look at it in the diet. Uh, it's a great way to help boost your nutrient intake, maybe fill some gaps, especially if you're someone who doesn't have a big variety of vegetables or maybe doesn't eat a lot. This is a great way to help improve the robustness of your diet, but there's no substitute for the real thing. You should always be having whole fruits and vegetables and those should always come first. But yeah, it's a supplement. It's definitely used as, I like how you put it, an insurance policy. Mm -hmm. And have there been any actual studies that show that it's beneficial to gut health or beneficial for energy, for skin? You know, everyone claims something. So it's yes. like, what's the, what's the truth? <laughs> right. Okay. Do you mind if I geek out on nutrition a little bit here? Please, please okay, do. Okay, great. <laughs> so first, it's really important to understand that, no, the science has not caught up with this booming industry. Uh -huh. There's just not a lot out there. There are a few much older studies on older green supplements, um, but we need a lot more to really understand what is happening. And we need good, robust studies on long-term effects. Mm -hmm. um, what we do know is that eating a lot of vegetables and plants and fruit, the more we have, the healthier we can be. And science agrees on this point. It's honestly one of the few things that nutritional science does agree on <laughs> is that the more plants we have, the better. Right. And, and I'm sure actually, it's also very hard to do a study on something like a green supplement because the people taking green supplements are probably already very focused on healthy living. So it's, is it the green supplement or is it the other choices that they're making in their lifestyle? 
that's exactly right. It's very difficult to do nutrition research because of that exact point, Mm -hmm. especially if we're looking retroactively at, you know, information that people have sub- submitted and saying, oh, we looked at these food logs from from 12,000 people from 20 years ago, and it showed that anyone who was taking too much vitamin C had this issue. Or, you know, we don't know what else was going on. All right. we do was looking at, so it can be very difficult. Um, another aspect, I don't know if you've talked a lot about nutrigenomics, but I find it enthralling. So I love this. So science is finding that even though our genes are inherited and that the expression of the genes, which is whether they're turned on or off, can be modified by our environment, um, even though we inherit them. So we do have a say in how our genes are expressed. Mm -hmm. So there are bioactive components in plants, things like the antioxidants, polyphenols, terpenes, flavonoids, these have been shown to play a big role in how our genes are expressed. So this means that what we eat can influence our health destiny. So by choosing to eat a diet rich in plants and vegetables and fruit, we are helping to form a health destiny that's right for us. Mm -hmm. Now, what does this mean for green powders? Well, I'd love to say that it's equivalent that because they contain all vegetables and plants and because we can see from testing as reflected from the supplement facts panel, that much of the plant's nutrition is transferred into I, I was going to ask powder. that next, kind of like, you know, when you do steamed vegetables versus roasted vegetables, some of that nutrition yeah. is lost, but it, it is, is actually maintained in the powder. Yep. Some of it is lost, but a lot of it is maintained. I'm actually, I was actually very surprised when I saw from the testing, how much is transferred. Um, and it's likely because they are ground down and powdered as whole raw plants Mm -hmm. versus, you know, being cooked first or something like that. So I think that's really beneficial in helping to preserve some of that nutrition. Um, So I would love to say that it's equivalent because we see all of this, but again, I can't say that yet because the research hasn't, it just hasn't caught up. Now, for us personally at, at Live It Up, we feel it's important to understand that we're having an impact and that the product is high quality and that it's nutritionally sound. And most importantly, that consumers are actually finding that it's helpful toward their health goals. So to help gather this, since there isn't enough research right now, we actually sent out a survey to all of our Super Green subscription customers. And um, this is what we have found from our customers. And many of them have been taking it for six plus months. So over 96% report feeling more energetic. Uh, Over 96% agree that super greens help them increase their daily greens and vegetables. 91.7% report feeling an improvement in their digestion and uh, a reduction in bloating. 94% say they feel uh, enhanced mental performance and 94.4% report feeling an improvement in their immunity. So we don't have the research, but we're going by what our customers are telling us that they're feeling. And honestly, from a nutrition perspective, this makes sense when it comes to a healthy immune system and normal cognitive function. And honestly, everything that happens in the body requires specific vitamins and minerals. So we, we have to be getting enough vitamins and minerals for us to function optimally and for all of these systems to feel, um, right. So, so it does make sense from a nutritional perspective that these things are actually happening, especially if someone like you and me go to the grocery store and, and we are in a rut and we kind of get the same things all the time. Having something like a greens powder can help fill in those gaps and get that nutrition from plants that we would honestly probably never have otherwise. Exactly. Um, and it tastes yeah. really good. If nothing else is also not, if nothing else, because obviously then it would be a very expensive water, but it is yes. also going back to the hydration part. If you're having another greens drink at the end of your day. That's just one more glass of water too. So obviously it's going to help you feel better and help with your skin health for just the hydration. Yes, purpose. absolutely. I love that. Yeah. Definitely, it's going to help with your hydration, especially if it's just that additional cup that's pushing you right over the edge of Mm -hmm. maintaining that adequate hydration. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I've tried them all. And when I sip on this, you guys, I'm not, 
I, again, I'm not getting paid. I asked Rachel to come on here. She did not ask to come on here. I was like, I would love to talk to you about this. This is the best tasting greens powder I have ever had. It's like a minty chocolatey taste almost. I can mix it with something. I can mix it with water and it's almost like drinking another protein shake or I just can just toss it down. And I'm like, I keep telling my husband every time I drink, it, I'm like, this is so good. It's like a thin mint. <laughs> yes. Yes. I agree. Have you tried the berry yet? No, I haven't. Oh my gosh. I, so I thought the mint was good until I tried the berry and the okay. berry is kind of a game changer. Uh, I didn't, I mean, total honesty, I didn't think I was going to like it because I thought, Oh, how's that going to work out? Um, but, but it works out really well. My, my favorite for both of them, for the mint and the berry, my favorite thing is to throw it into a smoothie and make it one of my, one of my snacks. Uh-huh. So I'll throw That's it what in. My husband like, does. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Like frozen blueberries, mm-hmm. a handful of baby spinach. I mean, might as well just make the most of it. Right. Right. I'll add some protein to it and just blend it up and drink that down. But yeah, I love, I, I, I'm not, I think what I like the most about it. And of course, I'm biased, but I've done a lot of research on a lot of the other products out there and we don't add any sugar or artificial sweeteners. And I think that that's an important aspect for me personally, what, what I enjoy about it. There's also no fillers, um, or preservatives, which unfortunately a lot of the other ones include, Mm -hmm. um, so for me, those are important aspects um, that and that all the vegetables are organic in it. So I don't have to worry about, you know, this tiny condensed thing of all these vegetables being also full of pesticides and herbicides. So, right. so for, for those, for that reason, I also enjoy it. Um, again, I, it's something that as I move forward and understand with all the nutritional research, those are important factors for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but everyone, you know, taste is most important because if you, if you get something, you don't like the taste, it was an expensive waste and right. it's just going to sit there on the shelf. Yeah. Gathering and all the green dust. supplements, no matter what are kind of, it's a pricey thing at the end of the day. You're all, I always say you're investing in your health. Kind of, like I said, it's kind of like the insurance policy, but if someone's just going at their grocery store and they're uh, cruise in the aisles and looking at everything, what would make a good green supplement versus like what some, maybe someone look out for and go, Oh, that's a red flag. Even though it's only $19 for the canister, I'm going to walk away. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so one of the thing I, one of the things I think is one of the most important parts, because we're looking at this as a supplement to your diet, mm-hmm. it has to have enough in it that would be beneficial. Mm -hmm. So there are some out there that have five ingredients. There are some that have 10. And while this might be more than what you're currently taking in, a lot of those nutrition fact panels or the supplement fact panels don't have a lot of vitamins and minerals on them. So if you're looking for something that is filling some gaps, you have to get enough in there. Now, on the flip side, you also can't have too much. If you have too much, then you're trying to pack a ton into a tiny little scoop and then you're not getting a lot of anything at all. That makes sense. So yeah, so there's kind of a a balance you're looking for. Generally, I find that somewhere between 20 and 30 ingredients are where you want to top out for plants. Um, The other thing you want to watch out for, as I mentioned, are fillers and preservatives. A lot of them have things uh, in them that just don't need to be there. And a lot of studies are now finding that things like preservatives and foods can affect our gut health and affect the healthy bacteria. And so anything that we can do to minimize uh, negative impact, especially if we're taking something for a positive impact is mm-hmm. going to be important. So that's another thing to look for. So minimal fillers and preservatives. Um, the other thing is, you know, if you're looking at this in terms of overall health and wellness, a lot of the supplements out there will have probiotics. Some won't tell you how much and some are really negligible. So if that's something that's important to you, you want to look 
for one with at least a few billion CFU. So that's something else to think about if probiotics are on your radar and it, it's something that you're looking for. Uh, I was just going to ask if they should look for something with probiotics and adaptogens are now in some of them and cordyceps uh, like you were talking about. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And it all depends on your goal. So some of them have adaptogens uh, and some of them don't. They focus more on, on other plants. So it really just depends on what are your goals? Are you mostly looking for something to help with stress and anxiety? Mm -hmm. Then maybe an adaptogen heavy one is the way to go. Now, those might not be as robust in terms of their supplement fact panel. So you might not see those as the multivitamin mm -hmm. equivalent, but they can help in other ways. They definitely have uh, benefits that um, could be what you're looking for. So it really is very indiv individual in terms of what you want those plants to be when it comes to uh, the ingredients. Gotcha. And as far as like prebiotics are concerned, when you see that, you kind of automatically think like, oh, awesome, the food for my, bac my bacteria, the probiotics. But yeah. isn't a prebiotic fruit and vegetables, <laughs> isn't that essentially already what it is? <laughs> yes. A lot of fruits and vegetables do have prebiotic fibers. You're right about that. And some supplements will add more fiber okay. just to make sure that there is something in there. Now, a lot of them, it's just two or three grams of fiber that they're adding. Sometimes they add in ground flax, for example, or um, inulin, from apples or something like that, that'll be what they add in. Um, interestingly enough, if the powder is ground the right way, there will still be fiber intact. So for example, with Live It Up, our most recent test showed that each scoop had three grams of fiber, even though we're not adding fiber. So the fiber is coming from the vegetables still. Uh, whereas other processes take the fiber out a little bit more and make it a little bit more difficult to gain that benefit. So you always want to look at the supplement fact panel. And if fiber is important to you, then definitely looking for one with either added fiber or fiber that's already in there can be a, an important strategy. Gotcha. And then I know that we are coming up on our time, but I want last question on this is, is there a right time of day? Is it early in the morning that you should toss it back? late at night? Does it not matter? What are your thoughts? <laughs> Honestly, and this is for most... <laughs> This is for most supplements. If I'm going to recommend something, it's whenever you're going to remember. Because the most benefit you get from something is when you take it consistently and it's part of your daily routine. If it's mm -hmm. at a time where you keep forgetting, then you got to move it around. Mm -hmm. Certainly a lot of people like it in the morning because it's that impetus to start the day on the right foot. And then you have that moving forward. Some people love it at night because it's when they remember the most, uh, it makes them feel good about the day and kind of like set that tone for when they go to sleep. So honestly, there is not a right time to take it. My biggest thing is just make sure it's consistent. Yeah. I actually like to take it at nighttime simply because, you know, my morning, I like to have my cup of coffee, my iced coffee in the morning kind of sets the mood. And then at night yeah. while I'm winding down, it's like my nighttime cocktail where it's not just water. It's still kind of like how I started the day, but with my greens to kind of cool it down. Yes. I love that strategy. I love that you called it your cocktail because I have done that too. I'll put it in like a special glass. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. And a little wine glass. It's great. Exactly. Makes <laughs> you feel it. better. Absolutely. So where can people find out more from you? Because I know that you also have your private practice. And then where can, if they're interested, find out more about Live It Up? Because you guys now have the greens, you have the turmeric powder, you have beets, which actually, I would love to have you on again to talk about the benefits. I've been a huge fan of beets for, I've been an endurance runner for almost 20 years now. And I feel like it does, it's not talked about enough. So we should talk about that as a whole other podcast sometime. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree that beets are not taken as much as they should for the amount of research that shows that they're beneficial for, right. for athletes. I, I, I love it. Yeah. Um, so if people want to learn more about Live It Up, they can go to the website, letsliveitup.com. We actually have a special 10% um, off code for your, um, for your listeners. If they want to try it, it's FW. W10. Awesome. And so if they want to give it a try, they certainly can. Um, you can find a lot more information on there. And 
if they have questions for me, uh, I am so happy to help answer anything or to help field any questions, not only about sports nutrition, but also about greens powders in general and, you know, what is important and, you know, even bringing to my attention different ingredients and what is that good for? Or is it even important? Should I look for that in a greens powder? I'm happy for all of that. So uh, they can reach out to me at Rachel at rgnutritionandwellness.com. And I'm happy to answer questions there as well. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. That was great. Absolutely. It's been such a pleasure, Kendall. Thank you. Thank you. What'd you think? That podcast was actually filled with a, a lot of awesome nuggets of information. Like I said, we wanted to talk about green supplements. What's the truth behind them? Are they all hype? Is there any actual evidence that they're beneficial to you? And now hopefully you at least have some information so that you can go forward and maybe using what you already have, or maybe you'll say, yeah, this is something that I want to add into my regimen, or maybe you're able to go, no, this really isn't for me. I don't need that. But whatever it is, I always want to make sure that I'm bringing you guys the information so that you can make those decisions on your own. And remember, never be afraid to experiment with stuff. You can always go back and change things up as long, obviously, as it is not doing anything harmful for your health. You can experiment with things and go, this works for me. This doesn't work for me. It's okay to tailor your nutrition to you and find out what works the best. And if you are interested in Live It Up, then you can use code FWW10 to get 10% off. So thank you to Live It Up Greens for that. And if you want to learn more from Rachel or connect with her, you can go to rgnutritionandwellness.com. I'll make sure to put all that information down in the show notes. And then just one little last thing before we sign off for the day. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. Thank you for hanging out with me as I do these. I love podcasting. It's actually my favorite form of content creation. So I'm really appreciative just to have this opportunity. But if you want to connect and you want to help the brand even more and you love chit-chatting with me, but you want to do it more often, then what I would recommend is getting more information from the show notes about the eight-week summer shred that's going to be starting on June 3rd eight weeks, no contract beyond that. All you are doing is signing up for an eight week program, start date, June 3rd. However, when you sign up, I will go ahead and give you instant access to Fit Women's Weekly Live. So you will have a couple of days or a couple of weeks, depending on when you lock in your spot of free membership to the group. So that is definitely something to consider. If you just want to get more information, all you have to do is email me, Kindle at Fit Women's Weekly. Dot com. And of course, you guys, my last thing, make sure to like and subscribe and leave a review for the podcast. And if you're watching this on YouTube, just leave a comment. Let me know. And I'd love to know what are the supplements that you are currently taking and what are you most excited about this summer? All right. Talk to you soon. Mwah. Hopefully I'll talk to you during the summer shred. Bye guys.